Hiya, so what's following here is my interview with Adam Conover, um, which was a surprising development in the course of making this video. Um, I, he came to me and was like, yeah, you want to talk about this? So I was like, yeah, I guess so. Um, but for anyone who is expecting something like a debate, um, ex you know, it's not going to be that. We're not, this isn't me or him going in trying to destroy each other's positions. It was more of an opportunity for me to ask Adam questions about his position, what he revealed, um, and, and what he revealed about his positions is what is most relevant here. Um, and it was also an opportunity for him to ask me about my positions. Um, that wasn't uh, anything combative uh, or anything like that. So if you're going in there expecting Adam destroys John, John destroys Adam, you're not going to get that. Um, it was a good conversation and uh, I'm, I'm glad it happened. Uh, at diff different points I've put up links to reading on topics which I think could be explored more in the future um, and those will, are in the, descri the description and everything. Um, but aside from that, this is pretty much the unedited footage of the interview. I uh, hope you enjoy. Cheers. It's easy. The quality great. won't be great, but people on my channel know not to expect high quality <laughs> video. <laughs> no problem. All right. Um, well, I mean, thanks for thanks for chatting to me. Uh, I'm pretty nervous about this. This is weird for me. Um, <laughs> not every day that you uh, that you just start talking about a show you didn't like on Netflix and the creator is like, hey, talk to me about that. <laughs> well, look, I appreciate you having the conversation. Um, you know, I, I saw that you were planning on making a video about the show. I uh, thought a lot, a lot of thought and work went into the show and exactly what we were saying. And I was, I'm very interested in the response and I'm especially interested in the response from folks in, in your world. And I'm really happy that you wanted to engage with it and, and wanted to have a conversation about it, you know? So yeah. I, I thank, thank you to you for it. No, it's, 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 a, it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> <laughs> for me too. Um, so I guess, um, I guess a good place to just start is, is at the beginning of the show because um, I think that's something that I noticed and something that seems to be at the forefront of the show is the worry that the show is in some sense propaganda because you mm -hmm. talk about that over with 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 producer of the show Barack Obama and yeah uh, and like well is this is this propaganda and Obama says to you in the show you can talk about whatever you wanted um, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to talk what how how did you think that that sort of influence or did you think that that sort of influenced the construction of your show because I, I will talk about a bit of propaganda in a second uh, absolutely it, it influenced the the production of the show i mean it's it's woven into the fabric of it and that scene you know i wrote and shot with the former president in order to try to first of all be transparent with the audience about the conditions under which the show were produced and try to be transparent about the the area that we tried to carve out for ourselves, you know, the the area of inquiry and like space that we have. So uh, look, the the foundation of the show is clearly compromised, right? I knew that it was going in. Um, it's like it, it, it's part of the conditions that are. Unfortunately, as someone working in mass entertainment, I don't have the luxury of making a piece of uncompromised content. And I would argue almost nobody does. Um, but ju just to draw a point of comparison, my last show, not sure if you're familiar with it, was called Adam Ruins Everything. It was on True TV, uh, cable, basic cable channel, advertising supported channel here in the US. Uh, and we made 63 episodes of that show. And the main focus of the show was advertising scams, consumerism, capitalism critique, you know, et cetera. Uh, and we're on advertising supported television, right? I'm trying to do shows about consumer debt or about advertising, right? And meanwhile, my show ends and five minutes of advertising for credit card start, right? These sure. are the conditions under which I work. And, uh, you know, all I can do is A, try to carve out space of editorial independence for myself where I get to say everything that I want to say to the extent that I can. Um, and two, I try to be transparent about it with the audience. We did multiple episodes of that show about here's our relationship with advertisers, here's our relationship with the network, right? Here are the ways in which you know, I'm grappling with the idea that the show is compromised in, in some sense, but, you know, we're trying to be like, give a full accounting of it. Um, and so when I had the opportunity to make 
this show, I, you know, I felt that there's a conflict at the core of it, but that I needed to approach it in much the same way to um, try to be clear about it with the audience to try to make sure that I can go to bed at night, not feeling that the show has been unduly influenced. And by trying to pick fights that will uh, do my best to disrupt that influence, right? Not to play nice with it, but to try to like, you know, pick some fights in which I'm going to go to the mattresses really hard in order to grapple with it. Um, and that's sort of the best I can do <laughs> or the best I've been able to do so far as like an artist working under capitalism, right? Um, mm. Because there's, there's no way to make something that is not going to be subject to like the whims of the marketplace or, you know, have the money people breathing down your neck or et cetera. Um, yeah. Do, sure you do, you, do, you, do you feel then that the show is in some sense propaganda? Well, let's start with you said you were going to describe what you felt propaganda was, and I would sure. love to know what it is so that we could I could be clear about whether or not I think it's what you would, might describe as propaganda. Sure. So so the way that this the show opens is you talk about like you talk with Obama, he's got this this um he's doing his taxes and you're saying, Can we talk about whatever we want? And Obama says, Yes, you you have editorial control. Mm -hmm. But to me, and, and to someone like if we're talking about propaganda as like described in Chomsky's model of propaganda, it's not about someone in power telling you what to write. It's about you as a person being in the position that you're in because your views are not in conflict mm -hmm. with the people who are producing it. And what it says to me when Obama is producing a show is that nothing that you do in the show is really challenging to any sort of ideological or economic foundation of Obama's politics and because he's a pre was a former president of the United States who's more establishment than that than the, poli the the sort of economic and ideological foundations of the state or government so I think that that uh, analysis of propaganda is uh, mostly right although I, I think there's probably a lot more we could say about you know what are the purposes of propaganda right does does Barack Obama have a particular uh, message he's trying to get across with the show, right? Like there's that much stronger form of propaganda. But when we're just talking about like, yeah, that issue of, uh, you know, who gets to sit in the chair. Rutger Bregman went on Tucker Carlson. Do you remember this a couple of years ago? Yeah. Um, and and he said to Tucker Carlson, you know, uh, you're sitting there, your, your bill, you know, your paycheck is played by Rupert Murdoch. And Tucker Carlson says, well, Rupert Murdoch doesn't tell me what to say. And then I think Bregman said afterwards, something along the lines of, oh, what I wish I had said to Carlson was that point about that, you know, you're sitting in the chair because your views are not offensive to Rupert, Mur Rupert Murdoch or his, you know, unholy offspring, right? Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, look, Barack Obama wouldn't have hired Noam Chomsky to make a show, right? That That's self -evidently... He wouldn't have hired me. <laughs> yeah, uh, probably not. And uh, there are things that, uh, look, there, there's, Yes, there's there's a there's a range of views that get me in the chair, right? I was aware of that going in. And part of my job is to try to push at that range. So uh, there are uh, th there are views that I espouse on the show or or investigations that we conduct on the show or questions that we ask on the show, answers that we give to those questions that are not things that in any world Barack Obama would have personally chosen to put in the show, right? Um, and my goal was an to example find those. those. Yeah, so we talk about, uh, you know, we talk about the neoliberal turn in American governance and and the idea that, you know, we, we you know, the government should uh, not be in control of things. We should give all of that to the market. And we portray Barack Obama's administration as being like beholden to that, uh, to those values under the Affordable yeah. Care Act. I know, I, I bet you have a lot to say about that. I have a lot segment. to say, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you do. I, I, look, the devil is going to be in the details here, right? But I, I'll, I'm giving you my account of it. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the segment that we did about uh, drone strikes, right, which came from uh, an investigation on our part of like, hey, how does the government interact with technology? Well, the government primarily has invented so much technology, but it's primarily done it for military purposes, you know, for reasons of uh, maintaining American military hegemony. Um, and the best example of that is drones. And, you know, that was like, uh, and, you know, the drones that have led to the deaths of uh, thousands of people. Um, and I know he disagrees with that segment <laughs> because he told me he did, right? Mm. Uh, but we did it anyway, right? And that was that was an example of like, all right, this is a fight that I need to pick um, in order to try to, I guess, 
I, I get sick of hearing about the Overton window, and I think it's probably the wrong term in this case, but to like shift the window of what is possible on a show like this, right? To try to push on those boundaries as much as I possibly can. Because uh, the fact is that, you, you know, I, <laughs> I don't think anybody else um, sitting in my seat is going to push in that way. That's what, you know, that was my intent was to try to say, okay, I'm, uh, I, I'm sitting here, I, I am in the position of making a show that is co-produced by Barack Obama, right? That gives me a platform I wouldn't have otherwise had. What can I use that platform to do that is going to be outside the bounds of what people expect from him, from what he feels like saying, that is closer to what I feel like saying, and that is going to push people in the direction that I'm interested in pushing them, right? Now, there's a limit to how much I can do that. I'm still doing it with Barack Obama. I'm making mass entertainment on Netflix for like the average person, right? I don't get to narrow cast and say, hey, I'm just talking to leftists or I'm just talking to, you know, folks like that. I, I'm, I have to go as broad as possible. Um, but Within that, I can like pick my battles such that I'm able to uh, say things that are, you know, my hope is genuinely a little bit uh, uncomfortable, right? Uh, for him, for the audience, um, and can open some uh, conversations that wouldn't have been had otherwise. Uh, that that was my approach. Mm. So I get like I've got sort of two different strands. I'll try and keep in my head at one time here. So I, I think in terms of like the conversations that Obama wouldn't want to have, things about like say neoliberalism or drone strikes. Yeah. Um, and both of those examples in the show, um, and I remember the specific line in terms of neoliberalism, you say even the Obama administration uh, compromised on market forces. Right. And I find that quite an interesting thing because it, it, it sort of constructs Obama and Obama does this himself as an unwilling participant in this process. When in reality, mm -hmm. he was an absolutely full-throated neoliberal from the beginning, like from his from his uh, campaigns, for, from his State of the Union address, from his uh, education reforms, deregulation, ta uh, tax cuts for businesses, austerity regimes throughout. And it's a fun it's a funny construction the show does to like say, oh, Obama kind of he failed in being able to shift this thing rather than like. He was very willing to engage in it and engage in it uh, in a way that, that was, you know, in line with the neoliberal paradigm. So, um, I, sorry, can I, can I just respond to that quickly? Yeah. I love that you picked out that particular sentence um, because, yeah, I mean, you, you know, uh, we worked on every sentence of the show very carefully. But, yeah, I love that you that you identified that. Um, that's one way to read it. Another way to read it and the way that I had in mind is that if you ask Barack Obama, and I know this because he told me th about his feelings about this segment, he said, whoa, whoa, whoa. He said this to me on the phone. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, whoa, I don't feel that I was you know, perpetuating you know, the Reagan regime of disemboweling the government and neoliberalism. I was trying to push things back the other way, right? And I said, whoa let's move on, right? I don't need to, I'm not trying to argue with the guy because there's no point to me doing that, right? Um, but that is what he says about himself, right? And he said mm -hmm. that on, he said, in the, said that in the press and like it or not, like for a huge portion of people in America, he is believed to be a big government Democrat, right? Someone who's trying to bring the government back. And so to yeah. me, the point of that sentence is to say, even, the, even this guy who has a reputation, not among smart leftists like yourself right uh, i'm sorry i don't mean to i don't mean to define you with an ist i'm, I'm not sure if that, if you apply that label but you know not among uh folks in the know but among the broad public he's believed to be the big government guy right and i'm saying there no even this dude was living under that regime and was perpetuating it right um even maybe he doesn't believe that he was but of course he was um and like that's uh, so you know, sure, there's a little bit of like negotiating in that language and we can talk about like the different shades of meaning to it. But I mean, we still fucking said it, you know, is, is my view. Yeah, I, and the, the, I, I, there's a sort of wider question of then about like the nature of that whole segment on neoliberalism on the on the sort of the construction of like the state as being gutted and it's a weak and ineffective state right mm -hmm. now, which is in its construction extremely neoliberal because that whole like notion of the state becoming weak and ineffectual as opposition to something called the market is a foundational tenant of that ideology that requires reconstruction over time 
And this kind of mm. set, I wanted to maybe get to this sort of later because getting into the nitty gritty details of what neoliberalism is. And I certainly don't blame you for not getting the exact right stuff on what neoliberalism is because that has been that I'm fucking Joseph Stiglitz and the, and all these economists still talk about, still talk about this shit about small government. It's never been about small government. It's about a really strong, forceful government that does particular things uh, in particular ways. Mm. Uh, and, and that sort of that sort of segment itself, in my view, played played to reinforce neoliberalism's own terms um, in, a, in a view to deconstruct it. Um, so I, I'm really I'm really curious about that point of view. Look, I'm not I. I I don't have your background in, you know, political science in in this sort of, uh, uh, you know, th uh, this sort of literature, right? Mm. So I'm, I'm really curious to to discuss that and to and to learn more about that view and to grapple with it. I'm happy to do that here or in a later part of the interview. You you drive, please. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think maybe we can put that to the side to the side at sure. the moment. Um, and the other the other part about drones. Um, yeah. So there there's a throughout the show there's like a tendency to humanize the state I mean, what's going on and bring it down to the people who are enacting it but when it came to drones and the discussion of them and the use of them the technology seems to be abstracted away from from everything like you say what are the unintended consequences of these reaper and predator drones which is a, a sentence i found very very funny because they're called predator and reaper drones these consequences aren't <laughs> unintended <laughs> and it seems like i think you could sort of conclude if the drones didn't exist if this technology didn't exist then these civilians might be alive which seems to separate the underlying sort of force of the government of, of the u.s state of military industrial complex from a technology like as if the technology wasn't there and the the rest of the state would be okay yeah, so what we try to do in that segment, um, and this is, uh, you know, our, our research team spent more on more time on this segment than any other, right? And what we are trying to do is give a really bulletproof account, of, uh, no pun intended, excuse me, uh, of what that technology did, right? The invention of the technology did. Um, and the very sort of like mainstream critique of drone strikes. And by the way, the reason it needed to be uh, bulletproof is because I'm making the fucking show with Barack Obama, right? And if I go out on a limb, um, I'm gonna have to have a lot of like, I'm gonna be on the defense, I'm gonna have to have a lot of conversations I don't wanna have, right? Um, but if I am really focusing on, hey, this is what like people who, <laughs> who study the invention of this technology um, have you know determined about the effects of it, then I'm on really firm ground, right? Because I'm like, well, look, there's fucking studies that say this. I'm saying them on television. You don't have much to argue with. Um, so the the point that we tried to make is that the invention of the technology created a moral hazard, right? Such that you can now order strikes that formerly you would have to have a pilot in a plane order the strike and you wouldn't want to send a plane over Syria or whatever because then the plane could get shot down. You might have to go like do a fucking Black Hawk down and rescue a pilot, right? And, and all this and it's bad press and et cetera. So the people who lead our military wouldn't want to do that. Um, when you uh, invent a technology that allows you to do it unmanned, it creates a moral hazard where it suddenly becomes much more tempting to order a lot more strikes. All these strikes you wanted to order before, you suddenly can. Uh, at very little cost to yourself because the drone gets shut down. Who cares? It's a couple of $10 million, you know, but it's it, it, it doesn't cause all these other problems. Um, and uh, I, I mean, again, th this is like, uh, you know, for us, that is the piece that that is the point that we are able to make that is basically incontrovertible and is rock solid. Now, what I feel that you probably would like me to do is to say U.S. foreign policy is a policy of imperialism maintained through military hegemony and the wanton death of, you know, many, many people overseas and their killings. And I would agree with all of that. Right. I, mm -hmm. I agree with that. I believe that that's the case. But that to me, like making a point about American foreign policy, American imperialism is more than I am able to do in a half hour episode of a show about the government. Right. Um, and so I'm not trying to wade into those waters. I'm trying to make a more specific point uh, in this case. This is an episode about technology and about military technology. It's an episode about the military industrial complex. It's about how, you know, our government has created, a, you know, incredible technologies um, that have transformed the world. It's always done them for military, for military defense and offense, right? 
Uh, and in or and we say directly on the show, the reason they're created is to maintain American military superiority, right? At the end of the show, we say, that's a bad thing. Maybe we should, <laughs> we could spend our societal resources on other things, right? Wouldn't that be good? Wouldn't that be good if we could, you know, work on solving the real problems that face us rather than figuring out better ways to kill people, you know? Now, to me, uh, this is, the, that is a, a statement about American military, um, uh, you know, uh, the uses of the American military that is pretty good for a half hour comedy show about television, you know, uh, on television. Um, I recognize that there are those who would want it to go further. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's like, that, that was the statement we were able to make at the time. Um, in terms of like it, uh, you know, being abstracted away. Well, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, you, you say so. I've I've been talking too long. <laughs> please, you. Yeah. Uh, please I get what I, for, I what all of this. What what it sort of says to me. Um, and I'm I've, I'm afraid I'm probably gonna have to use it a lot. Is that that sort of indicates the bounds of it becoming a, a show which is essentially liberal propaganda, and that it's like saying these problems, obscuring the 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 underlying causes. And I recognise that that's something that you can't do on that show, but that's. You know the point that I'm making, that that you can't do that on the show means that you're sort of able to say, oh, drone strikes are bad, and lots of technology is developed from within the U.S. state, but without saying that bottom part, you're not really saying much of anything, except, you know, people get to say, oh, isn't it bad we have drone strikes? Maybe we shouldn't. That's not really. It, it doesn't really say much to me. I mean. <sighs> I guess I disagree on that point. Like, I, I would love <laughs> to do a show in which I go into all of those deeper issues. First of all, I'm I'm not an expert on them, right? Um, I made myself an expert in in the topics that we uh, talk about on the show because those were the those were the ones that we were covering. Um, but like again, this is this is a show that is for a mass audience. This is a show that is to get people who, you know are going to work who are you know they're 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 an accountant in Idaho somewhere <laughs> you know what i mean and they're it's 11:30 at night and they're watching a piece of entertainment and i'm trying to uh, spark for them like questions about these systems um, and i'm trying to get them to think about it a little bit more deeply and so you know this is this is step 1 of hopefully a process of that person diving deeper into these questions you know mm. um, and and i think part of like you know the disagreement between us might be about which audience we're focusing on right because like for instance there's a reason i don't say i don't say the word neoliberalism on the show right and that's because uh, yeah, yeah. it's jargon people don't know what the fuck it means right but i'm just yeah. you can tell that that's what i'm describing right yeah um, yeah, I, yeah i get that and i could go into a whole analysis of what neoliberalism is but it would be kind of far away from people right um a, a whole lot of what we're trying to do is and a whole lot of the limitations that are on the show are not because we're on Netflix and not because we're doing it with Barack Obama. It's because we're trying to, it's comedy and we're trying to speak to a wide audience. Um, and we're trying to like get people into the wide funnel and bring them down to a narrow point. So the, what I would say is uh, I'm not, I was not prohibited from doing an episode about like, uh, you know, American imperialism or, or things like that. I was trying to make a narrow point because it's mass entertainment and that's the only point I have time to make. Um, so can, can I, let me just give you an example of a, of a different episode that we, uh, uh, we did not make. Um, and I will just to give you an example of the sort of thing that we were trying to tell stories about on the show, um, was we did, uh, we wrote a script for an episode called power. Um, and the episode was, it was, there were some parts there about the power grid and actual electrical power, what the department of energy does. Right. Then we go on to talk about, uh, the development, you know, the American development of nuclear weapons, uh, how the Department of Energy has to store all the waste from nuclear weapons and nuclear uh, power deep, deep beneath the ground. That's like a, a just a, a weird function that the government does that's covered in Michael Lewis's book, The Fifth Risk, that this was based on. Um, but we also talk about how, like, you know, the entire, <laughs> like, American 20th century is based on, you know, American military hegemony that came out of nuclear weapons. And then what we were going to do for the end of the episode was travel to the Marshall Islands um, and see that, you know, on the Marshall Islands, there's a there's a dome 
uh, you know, this is another nation, but it's basically a client state of the United States because they're so dependent on the United States. Um, there's this dome on the islands that is filled with American nuclear waste that is left over from uh, American nuclear weapons tests. And the people of that country say, hey, could you please remove this leaky dome full of nuclear waste? <laughs> and the American government says, no, nah, it's your dome. It's on your island. Uh, we don't know how it got there. Fuck you. Right. And the reason we're able to do that is because of the amount of power that we wield. Um, the, that are, And so maybe that's an episode that would have been a little bit closer to some of the topics that you wish we had discussed. The reason we didn't do it was because I decided as we were looking at our six episodes that uh, we, we were writing the show in the middle of the, uh, uh, the wake of George Floyd's murder. And I decided that even though we had that script in the can, I really wanted to do an episode about uh, the criminal justice system uh, and mass incarceration and uh, district attorneys and a episode that grappled with my own very pressing need of like, you know, how do we change the government when it is like hurting and killing us, right, uh, as Americans? Um, and so that's part of the reason that the show is focused a little bit more domestically rather than in a foreign way. Uh, but that was also our framing the whole time was we were, our framing was how does this affect the lives of Americans? Because we're making a show for Americans. Uh, so, but that, but that's like, we wrote that script, we got to three drafts, we were going to make it. You know, um, we weren't prevented from making that script by, you know, uh, you know, some liberal shaking his fingers at us saying, you know, no, you must espouse the the liberal line, you know. Uh, so, yeah. I, sorry. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I again, like, I, I don't think that's how I, I never would have thought that's how the sort of that would work, that you would be prevented from doing some certain things. Yeah. Um, I I, re I do recognize that there is a difference in like audience and and that you're not talking to my like twenty thousand communists on the site. <laughs> I'd love I'd love to be able to talk to your twenty thousand communists. Yeah. you know, and and, and part <laughs> they're, they're of my lovely. <laughs> I'm sure they are. And part of my goal as a communicator is to is to be able to loop those groups together and and have people. Such as yourself, I would love it if you were if you watched the show and said, "Okay, I see what he's attempting here, and it's a project that I can that I can get on board with, even though it's you know it, it was unable to say X, Y, or Z." But hey, that's what you're doing there on YouTube, you know. Um, uh, it, that's part of the difficulty of of being a mass communicator, which is the perverse job I've set for myself. But I'm sorry, please go on. Yeah, I and I I don't I I. I don't think I accept that because something is made for a general audience that it necessarily has to take all of the what I see is a lot of liberal baggage and I think we can talk it'd be good if we talk about like what we think of like as the state or as the government in a second so we can sort of yeah. pick out the differences there um so I, I don't necessarily I think it would be very hard to try and do a Netflix show about like like fucking why the state is is uh, ultimately a capitalist construct that can't be worked through but I, I i don't think it's necessarily impossible to talk about that to a general audience um like i mean i i do i or do organizing um I, mm -hmm. I i work on the street and you talk to people on the street and it's you don't find it that I, you, it, it's you simplify things and you talk about things differently but i don't find it that difficult to I don't mean to like disparage you, but I don't think it's that difficult to like take a radical critique that is like the reason, like I do a lot of work in housing, like the reason housing is fucked is because housing as a commodity exists and that's because property exists and you can get people involved and I find housing is a particularly useful example of that. I, I, look, I agree that you can speak to people and I do a lot of organizing work myself and I agree with you about that. Um, but it's much different when you're talking to someone one on one about an issue they care about when you're doing organizing work versus when you're trying to entertain people and get people to watch something on their television. And so if you wanted to make that show about uh, the state and how it is, you know, uh, constructed by capitalism, which would be a great show, I would love to make that show. And I could write a pitch for that show and I could go take a meeting at Netflix. Their question would be, well, why are people going to watch it? Mm -hmm. Like what, what's entertaining about it? That is the number one problem. How do we get people to fucking watch the show? Um, and, and that's the, that is the, the fundamental difficulty. So for instance, when you, you know, why is the, why is the framing of our show, how the government affects your life, right? 
it's because that's the way we're trying to get people to watch it is, is by saying, no, this matters to you in this really direct way. Um, and so, that, you know, that that is the that that is the biggest constraint on us. That was the biggest constraint on us as a show. You know, there there was sure there was some uh, uh, wrestling with, uh, you know, the various executives who would be like, oh, is this can we really say this? Is this politically true? You know, and we said, well, we have a study and we did this. And, you know, I'm, I'm used to I do that shit at True TV, too, you know. Um, but that's not that hard. I'm smarter than the executives and I can, I can argue my way around them. You know, the, the hard part is getting people to actually, you know, decide to watch it rather than watch, is it cake? Um, or, you know, whatever else is on Netflix that day. Uh, but sorry, go on. So, yeah, I guess then the, the sort of question about, uh, well, well I, we'd, we'd probably go around on this is, is going to get to what we, what we consider, um, the nature of the state and sort of the nature of action within that because probably we're yeah it's clear you're bound by particular uh particular logics of like netflix and uh, making something entertaining because you're making something on netflix i mean i make stuff on youtube i i try to make jokes even though i'm desperately unfunny and i wear big shirts to compromise <laughs> you do well <laughs> <laughs> i've seen your videos they're good man uh, uh thank you um so so i guess the the question is then you talk about the the G words in the show, but I, I kind of you left unclear about what is the state, what is the government, and a lot of the time the way it's communicated is, um, I think the the last the last um, sort of soliloquy to camera is that the government is is a reflection of us and how we are, and that's why it, it's 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 caring and cruel and mm-hmm. big and, and and all these things because those are reflections of who we are. Um, but beyond that, it's hard. I don't really get a sense of what government is from the mm-hmm. show. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's accurate. Uh, I don't have an ideological or philosophical theory of what the state is. You know, I have a bachelor's degree in philosophy. I mostly studied cognitive philosophy. You know, like Descartes shit. You know, what I mean, what is the nature of consciousness? That kind of mm-hmm. thing. Um, I, I'm not a, a you know, I'm not I'm not a political philosophy person. Um, and I didn't go in with a broader theory of it. And if you were to tell me, hey, here's my theory of what the state is, as you are doing over the course of this interview, <laughs> sure. um, I- I'm not going to argue with you about it because you you do study it. And, uh, you know, I-, I think you know your business better than I do. Um, what I'll say is that the show for me was a looser, more on the ground investigation of what the government is, not one that was designed to come up with a particular all-encompassing framework for what the government or what the state is, but one that was just trying to expose the reality of what it is on a day-to-day basis. Um, and you know, I, I guess, you know what, I, I, I misspoke because I do have an ideological or philosoph- philosophical belief about what the state is to a certain extent, which is that I do believe that it is a reflection of humanity writ large, right? It's a human institution. It's created by people. Uh, one of my deep beliefs is that everything that is a problem in the world is is humans doing what humans do, right? Everything that is right in the world is humans doing what humans do. Um, and uh, so getting down to the granular human level was important to me. Uh, and, you know, now, look. Uh, I, I, that's not like a meant to be a platitude and say like, Hey, it's just, you know, it's all nice. It's just human. It's not, you know what I mean? Like it's fucked up and there's systems and there's structural problems and there's, you know, all of those sorts of things. But like, you know, the, the fact that it's people all the way down is, uh, is true and interesting to me. So, um, however, I don't think that that th- there's not, there's not a ton to that. It's just sort of the perspective that I take when I'm, looking at these things does hmm. that make sense yeah that makes that makes sense um i get the, the, <laughs> like that, that you're like that that's internally coherent but i <laughs> but yeah. i think it's bullshit or so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> i guess like the reason that, 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 that i sort of question the what is like what your view of as the state isn't because i think that the show as it is necessarily needs that to function okay. as it is but because of the way because of my understanding of how the state is, aspects of the show uh, kind of spookily closely map on to a, an understanding of how the state works to propagate itself. 
Um, so, for example, one of the major sort of one of the things that people like um, just to, just a name drop people to seem smart, people like Gramsci or Palantis would talk about is like the state um, abstracts how it works for a particular class to view, make everyone view it as if it works for everyone. And that is mm -hmm. something that, that is absolutely essential to it. It's like they call it a managed equilibrium to sort of produce a national uh, to, to fake a national progress. And that seems to be something that the show does quite a lot, like in grouping together we the people, the state should be working for us. Uh, you're sort of constructing this notion of an us, which is in line with like as it's interacting with the state in line with the state's own need to present itself. Well, when I, in my view, when I say on the show, you know, it should be working for us, that's not the state's us, that's my us. And I try to go to great lengths to include everybody who lives in America in that us, right? Um, and and I could I could also extend it to like humanity writ large. I We didn't end up doing that on the show. Um, uh, although we do, you know, again, talk about like civilian deaths overseas and et cetera. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we went to great lengths to, portray moments in which the state does not care for uh you know large segments of of americans you know we we for instance yeah. drew the contrast between uh you know the the disaster response from fema and other agencies in texas versus in puerto rico um which like to me is a counter example to to what you're saying unless there's a part of your view i'm not understanding um so so it's Take that, that example that I'm going to use in, in, in the video to sort of illustrate this point is um, so we talk about the civil rights movement um, the civil mm -hmm. rights movement won huge, uh, huge concessions from the state via um, civil unrest, direct action, rioting on the streets. Uh, but the way that was folded in via the state was a narrative of national progress that we are dealing with this great harm in society. Um, we're taking this this injustice which exists within um, within sort of society within our state, and we're we're fixing it. And because of that, we're all progressing forward. So it doesn't one one sort of important feature is that the state isn't saying isn't like saying oh everything's great for everyone all the time. It is using tensions and uh, divisions that exist within society to maintain itself and to and it uses them to smooth over things. Um, a good example in, new, in your show being something like the bank runs, the way that bank runs are, are, mm -hmm. are spoken about. Um, and you talk about it as, as a effective, really effective government program that bank runs don't happen anymore because of this government regulation. But the regulation doesn't exist because it cares about people, it exists to perpetuate the conditions for capitalism. So it uses these divisions to maintain and develop its own sort of like maintain itself and maintain the conditions for accumulation. So I guess I, I don't quite follow how I understand how you could have the perspective that the only reason the, you know, American government in the 60s passed the Civil Rights Act was to create a like to smooth over a division and, and perpetuate itself. But I don't I don't I, understand the I don't, basis I don't. for that claim. I don't mean to say that it's a conspiracy, that it's a conspiracy that people in in government did this thing, but that yeah. in interacting, you know, a big, you get into sort of theories of rights here, a big part of uh, codifying rights through legal institutions is how they stifle and uh, sort of put a box around social movements. And that's, you know, that's a big critique that a lot of um, black radicals had of the outcome of the civil rights movement was putting in a box civil a thing called civil rights um, and it's a big sort of critique that human rights legalism gets re uh, um, leveled at it as well it's more of a sort of the filtering of struggle through this uh, mode of the state that, that confines it and, and always maintains those conditions okay I mean that look that's a <laughs> it's a theory that I'm not familiar with right uh, it, I don't I don't have an argument against it. I, I have trouble understanding how I would, you know, account for that again in a in a half hour comedy show. Mm -hmm. um, and it, uh, you know, there were when we brought up the civil rights movement in the show, for example, we were 
making an argument. Uh, the only reason we brought it up is we were making an argument that the white backlash to the civil rights movement was like a big part of the eventual neoliberal turn that came with Nixon and Reagan, right? Um, and so it, it's you know difficult for me to to know how I would incorporate you know this uh, this other theory about uh, what the state does, um, but. It's true. I mean, I, I didn't have a going in a, a particular, like I said, philosophical or ideological commitment into, you know, here's what I believe the, the state is. Um, I was, you know, again, focusing on a more narrow project, which was uh, looking at what it does on a in an on the ground way uh, that would you know, get people to think more deeply about it in a way that like maybe sends them down the road that you're talking about. Mm. Um, so, uh, I, I, look, if the, if the, if it's a failing of the show that, uh, I, and you know, the, the research staff that we assembled, you, you know, don't share that, uh, you know, background in, in political philosophy, the, I'll accept that, you know, that's, that's not something that we, uh, set out to do on the show. Um, and, uh, it's possible that it might have been a better show if if we had. Um, but I don't, I don't think that like I'm an asshole for <laughs> for not for not being familiar with that entire you know body of uh. critique. Um, and, and I also don't know that I that I agree with it right now off the top, off the top of my head. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I I don't think you're an asshole. <laughs> I, or 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 a shill or or whatever you know um yeah i mean i i i, I, I don't think at, at any point that you were insincere about anything that you've made like to be clear i still do think it's quite liberal propaganda and does things that uh, <laughs> and I, okay well, well well but but l let me ask like what what do, so when i hear the word propaganda what i take it to mean is that there is someone who is trying to spread a particular message, right? That they, mm. they're setting out to, to spread a very particular message that redounds to their benefit specifically. And I think propaganda also carries the connotation of them being in a, in a position of power, right? Um, and uh, to that extent, I, I, you know, I don't know that I think that that is what this show is doing. Now, Sure. If you were to say that, hey, there's some extremely deep ideological commitments that we end up, you know, uh, not fully grappling with at every single step of the way, I probably wouldn't disagree because I'm someone who is still learning about this shit, right? In the same way that I unpack my own biases in all kinds of areas, right? I'm, mm -hmm. I also, like, am, have been doing my best over the course of my lifetime to unpack you know, decades of growing up in the United States, right? And hearing this shit every single day. And that's part of what I do on the show. You know, mm -hmm. I, I say on the show that I was brought up, my mom saying, uh, my mom, who is a good liberal, right? Saying, um, oh, the government can't do anything and, and uh, corporate, you know, corporations are much more efficient. And I just remember hearing that as a child and kind of believing it until I was like 25 and like read something that maybe, hold on a second. Oh, wait, this was something I was told for a reason, you know? Um, so, you know, there, there may be, there probably are more hidden things in the show that way. Um, and one of the reasons I want to come on was I wanted to hear about them from you, right? However, it's not the case that, uh, you know, Barack Obama said, I want to spread a particular, you know, false impression about the way, you know, the, about the state, you know, and the power of sure. the state. And I'm going to do it by creating a Netflix show. The dude's just trying to make money. You know, <laughs> like he's, he's trying to make money and he also has his very broad set of concerns about, uh, you know, uh, spreading positive ideas and making people feel more included in, uh, you know, their government and society. But let's be honest, the, the, the kind of stuff that he wants to spread is so anodyne, it's like meaningless. You know, it's just like, it's, it's just, hey, go vote, participate, da, 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 da. And you can see that because that's all the other stuff that he makes. You know, if you watch, if you watch, uh, you know, uh, the other the other things that Higher Ground has put out, they're they're practically contentless in terms of their, uh, you know, how much they grapple with any issue whatsoever, except for the film American Factory, which was um, produced by a different company and they later acquired, which I thought had some really interesting things to say about labor and globalization and stuff like that. Um, and so, you know, uh, like literally all that. 
he, he, like Barack Obama's entire involvement with the show, right? He reads Michael Lewis's book. Michael Lewis is a great journalist. You know, he's like, wow, this book is really good. I'd like to make a TV show out of it. He options the book, right? Then he's like, what should the TV, be sh TV show be? He's like, I have no idea. Um, maybe comedy. I think comedy might be good. I've seen John Oliver and John Stewart, maybe something like that, right? Um, and that's like it. <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> like, that's literally it. Well, oh, people should know more about the government. You know, it was a complete blank canvas. Um, and, uh, you know, over the course of the show, he read all of our scripts one time. We had a half hour phone call where he, sh where he shared his thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and some of them he, he, told me for, it was longer than half an hour, because he told me for about 20 minutes, he explained his position on drone strikes, uh, to which I listened. And then I said at the end, well, we disagree. And then we moved on. <laughs> and by the way, it was the same position. He's, he's on tape saying the exact same thing. You know, yeah. college students are always asking him at forums, say, hey, what about drone strikes? And he'll just say the same stuff. Um, and, uh, and that's it. That was the entire thing, you know? So, um, uh, you know, there like that, that like propaganda is to me, uh, somebody saying, well, hey, there's this message we're trying to get across. And in this case, they're like, kind of genuinely wasn't one. In fact, if there had been one, my job would have been a lot easier because I would have had to spend a lot less trouble like figuring out what the fuck I was trying to say, um, which is a challenge just for me. I mean, my biggest challenge was, was you know, making a show about the government, which is so massive. Uh, and maybe this is actually part of where we disagree. Uh, in my view, the government is so fucking huge that it's impossible to say almost one thing about it that is true because it has so many different facets and so many different parts that do so many different things um that you know the conclusion was the hardest part to write because i was like well what the fuck am i going to say about this thing you know that is that could possibly even make sense that is a summary right mm -hmm. about something as as multifarious as the government mm -hmm. um so yeah i mean i I, I don't know. I mean, There's I, maybe I, a technical I, definition of propaganda that is different than what I'm saying, but that is what it means in my view. Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I don't. I don't think. Yeah. I don't think that you were setting out, or that Obama was setting out to do something. Um, I, I, I tend to not think the people who have that much power are that smart to, <laughs> or dedicated <laughs> to do that. Uh, but what when I when I say propaganda, I do mean that it, it takes in and, in my view, reinforces deeply liberal assumptions about the way the world works, about the way the state works, and all of that, and is produced in such a way. And and in the way that the the solutions are are presented is, in my view, quite liberal as well. And and, and the way it sort of funnels action, which I think is speaks to something that you're talking about in like moving um uh, moving a broad audience in a certain direction mm -hmm. um and so I, so i think the way that the way that you spoke about being in the show you have this position of power and you wanted to move in a particular direction it seems similar to the way in which you f seem to see change in in the state as getting good people in power and moving the state in the direction of of good people um, is that sort of fair? Do you want to get the sort of good people into these positions so that you can do good things? I I think I would characterize that as being a pretty good intermediate goal. I wouldn't characterize that as being like a a solution to uh, what ails society. Um, <laughs> but I think it's a uh, I think it can be helpful <laughs> to <laughs> do so. And I can talk a little bit more about why. But but uh, please finish first. Sure. Um, so and and the the show the way that's presented is is uh, through the the progressive DAs getting those um, better people elected and then contesting local elections uh, you know via via the state and my worry then is that this is funneling something which could be uh, pushing towards alternative modes of of action into a narrow electoral frame which would uh, in my view sort of um, be a pressure valve, I get a release of a sort of um, movement rather than in anything that would fundamentally challenge the movement at all, like the, 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 the structures of the state at all. Um, I think the, the DAs, progressive DAs, is a good example of this um, because they all of the all of the literature that I've read anyway on, on progressive DAs views them as being a um, non-abolitionist reform something that does a limited amount of good but only a very limited amount of good um and 
can suck up social movements to become focused on these these DA races, which are ultimately not beholden to those people, but funded from large super PAC money. Uh, and all that, in my view, is really cutting off the legs of any sort of potentially radical social movement and putting it into a very acceptable framework. Well, look, I I'm really, really happy to talk about this piece of it because I think this is like the big question of our times, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so to give you a little background on that segment, uh, you know, over the last couple of years, I've had the uh, uh, I've had the opportunity to get really, really involved in uh, politics and, you know, uh, social movements here in Los Angeles where I live. Right. And uh, there's that debate happens here in Los Angeles as well. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, what do we want to do? Do we want to try to get people elected or do we want to try to build a movement uh, that is, you know, not based on electoralism that is broader than that? Uh, and to me, my view is I don't see a reason why we can't do both. Um, but I also follow the lead of other org of other organizers and frankly, you know, people who are spending more time organizing than me because I'm spending half my time being a comedian. Mm -hmm. um, but to be clear, I'm also a member of two unions. I'm uh, part of the leadership group of my more the union I'm a member of that's more militant, which is the Writers Guild of America West. Um, and uh, you know, I'm I'm a member of a number of other groups here here in Los Angeles. So I try to I try to do everything all at once, right? And uh, the the groups that we have here in LA. Uh, are focusing on electoral victories, on flipping city council seats, and on flipping our district attorney seat, and and those demands are coming from the movement. You know, uh, one uh, seat that is very likely to be flipped here soon um, is uh, City Council District 13. By the way, we have extremely powerful city council people people here in Los Angeles. We we have a very small number of them, and they're basically like mini mayors, and each one of them oversees you know a quarter a quarter of a million people. Um, and so uh, there's one candidate here in LA named Hugo Soto Martinez, who uh, is uh, an, uh, a former organizer of Unite Here, which is a very militant, very powerful uh, hospitality workers union. Um, and this is a guy who's, his, you know, his his life is devoted to organizing. He's about building community power, right? Um, and his section of the movement, like the way that they have, what they have realized is if they want to accomplish what they want to accomplish, like they need to take literal electoral power because that is the system that we live under. Um, and he's about to win uh, the election in November. Uh, there's another uh, city council person who just won named Eunice Hernandez, um, who is a vocal abolitionist. She's a, a, an abolitionist of the criminal justice system. And she just won in CD1 running as an abolitionist, which is like an incredible victory. Uh, we also have a progressive district attorney, George Gascon, who um, I don't, I uh, was not a part of how he got elected, but um, uh, his, you know, election was championed by uh, Black Lives Matter and other parts of, uh, you know, that movement here in L.A. Um, he's been in power only a very short time and is already, you know, the forces of like white supremacy and nimbyism are trying to recall him, et cetera. Um, so these these are projects to me, getting those folks elected that that to me seem meaningful. Uh, now. You could come back to me in 10 years and I could say, uh, you know what? It didn't work. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like we weren't actually able to change anything. Uh, well, we kept some people out of prison and that was a good thing. But, you know, at the end of the day, we're going to need to do, do something stronger. Maybe I'll say that, but I don't feel wrong for, you know, following the lead of organizers who are part of the most like vibrant, militant social justice movement in my community. To give you another example, the group that we talk about in uh uh, the uh, in our final episode, in the change episode, Reclaim Philadelphia, um, are all, you know, this is a group that came out of the Bernie Sanders campaign, for, former Bernie Sanders organizers. And this is the social justice movement in Philadelphia. These are the folks who are organizing their communities, you know, who are, um, who are protesting, who are building power um, in every other way that you could want. You know, this is labor, this is, uh, you know, the, the social justice movement, et cetera. They're also trying to get people elected and they got Larry Krasner elected and people are not in jail right now because Larry Krasner was elected and they defended him in the face of a backlash, you know? So is that the most important part of their work? 
it might not be. We, you know, we could in the future say, uh, I might agree with you in five years, right? But right now, I'm like, I'm fucking happy the guy's in office and there are, you know, 16 year olds aren't going to prison for 10 years for having an eighth of weed in their pocket. I think that's good, you know? Now, if you're going to say, oh, it's reformist, it's not enough, et cetera, we should do more. I might agree with you, but I don't feel like a shithead for telling people that this is something that we can do too, you know? Now, I think a really valid critique of the episode is that we focused a little bit too much on electoralism. Um, uh, you know, I'm very happy that we that we profiled Reclaim because they do a lot more work than that. Um, and by the way, Reclaim, th this, is, this is not a go vote blue episode, right? Reclaim Philadelphia runs against Democrats. This is an insurgent group and the Democratic Party of Philadelphia and Pennsylvania hates their guts but they're kicking their asses. And so one of the things I was very proud of was I got to promote these folks on Barack Obama's show, right? This is, this is an insurgent group. Uh, I shouldn't have called it Barack Obama's show. It's my fucking show, but you know, his, <laughs> name is, his name is in the credits, but it is my show. <laughs> anyway, be very clear. Uh, but so uh, maybe he doth protest too much. Um, uh, but so what, 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 the, what the hell was my point? Um, uh, oh yeah, here, here's, here's what I was talking about. Uh, so I'm very happy that we were able to promote them to a really broad audience and say that this is the way forward. This type of community organizing that brings in all kinds of stakeholders from labor, from social justice, from everywhere else, um, is, uh, the way forward to not just flip seats, but create change more broadly. Now, what I wish I had said at the end, and this is a matter of me evolving over the two years since I wrote the episode, literally wrote the episode two years ago because we were stalled from COVID, mm. um, uh, what I have realized in my life since, and what I try to tell people to do now, if you look at any interview with me or, or anything I do on social media, is uh, to try to say, don't just vote, fucking find something to join. You know, find a group in your area that is working on an issue that you care about and start showing up to meetings, you know, mm -hmm. because that is what the right does in the United States to great effect. Um, and I think that is ultimately more powerful. I'm one of those people who believes that... Uh, you know, uh, the change that we need to see in America is going to come probably from the labor movement before it comes from anywhere else, because that is sort of the, the heart and soul of working class organizing in the United States. Um, so I think that that is incredibly important as well. And if I were to rewrite the segment right now, I would say, you know, I, I, I would I would still say vote locally because it's still the case that not enough people do, especially not enough uh, working class people, not enough young people. And as a result, white affluent NIMBYs run the show. That's a problem in the United States. And I, I think it's important to correct. Uh, but in addition, go find something to show up to every week. Don't just vote, you know, vote and, mm -hmm. and then knock out. Organize, 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 organize. Um, I yeah, think that, that, that message the, is still yeah. buried, but I would have liked to have surfaced it a little bit more. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, a message like that would have been uh, like, uh, very different in, in the show. And it, it's, I, I really, I'm not lying, and I did try to see that in the show. I, you just, I just didn't see that, that come across much um, within the show. I, which I, I mean, I, I, I would I would point you again to the to the material with Reclaim Philadelphia because th that is that's a movement right that is the movement in Philadelphia um, and we spent you know seven minutes eight minutes of, sure. doesn't sound like a lot objectively but in television it's a long time profiling what they do and how they do it um, and but, and you know the, and and <laughs> serving their movement and what they're trying to accomplish. I mean, within within a context where people know who they are and what they do beyond electoralism. It kind of that looks like you're profiling a group who does contest elections and doesn't like organize in that other other realm, which uh, maybe a, a particular misreading to me, but that's how, how I've, I've watched the show three times now. That's kind of how it comes across. <laughs> wow. Oh my God. That's you must you must hate my fucking guts at this point. Wow. Incredible. Well, thank you. I mean, that pushes up my numbers a little bit, which is good. I, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I screenshotted it from Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's hard to that's hard to screenshot things from Netflix. Uh, Look, uh, I, 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 the other thing I'll say is that to a certain extent, um, one of the things with trying to push back on some of these really deep narratives in American society is sometimes you need to draft off of them a little bit, you know. So. Everybody says, you know, the thing that we're constantly told as Americans is vote, 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 right? And people feel it deep inside them. And so to me, pointing people towards local action, right, um, and saying, hey, this is an area where if you 
uh, participate, you can uh, have a lot of impact in your community um, is still helpful because it still leads people down that road. Like for me, getting involved in the campaign of a particular uh, uh, candidate who, you know, was a DSA member who is uh, running to end mass incarceration and all these sorts of things, getting involved in her campaign, getting her elected, that was part of, for me, getting involved in, you know, these broader movements. And I hope it will be for other people as well. And honestly, that's what I try to do as a communicator. Like the, the best compliment that I get is when people say to me, um, or I see in the comments of a YouTube video or whatever, you know, hey, uh, when I, I saw your work five years ago and it put me down the path of radicalism that I'm on now. Um, I hear that from people. And I'm very proud that I was able to do that on advertising supported television, you know, when I'm just making a sketch comedy show that I'm trying to make people laugh, you know, um, that I can like sort of, sort of funnel them in that direction. I'm the, I'm the last stage of the informational food chain. I'm the widest part of the funnel. I'm just trying to get people in the door. Um, and so hopefully we're able to do that. Now, I will always be self-critical and say, hey, there's a way that I, I wish I had said it this way instead. Um, but I'm you're never not going to feel that way. You're trying to get people uh, in so that they get to my channel and go, wait, I find this Adam show really, <laughs> really frustrating now. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I, it, it's, it's your right to find it frustrating. And I was excited to talk to you because I want to know why you found it frustrating. I, I'm just like, I just want folks to know that I hope we feel at the end of the day like we're part of the same project of like dismantling the systems that are uh, understanding, first of all, and then dismantling the systems that hurt people, that kill people, and that result in the horrible world that we live in today. Um, this show for me is is part of my attempt to continue to do that. Um, and I'm not going to say it's perfect, but it's a it's a good faith effort to do so. And I and I do hope and think that it's a positive contribution to that at the end of the day, even if, you know, I look back at it and say, oh, I could have added a sentence or two here about this or that, and I, w I would have felt it would have been better. Sure. Um, but anyway. On, on, on like the, and sorry, let me know if I'm taking too much of your time, um, by the way. Um, on, on like, so obviously, like, I don't think it's necessarily bad to um, vote in your local elections and, and all that stuff. It's not like you're morally uh obliged to not vote to, to to do whatever maybe in terms of the labor party in the uk you're morally obliged not to vote for them because fuck them um but uh but like <laughs> in, in my local area we have the left-wing people in the local authority i guess similar similar to to i think your context it's a massive area i live in um in london that has a powerful mayor who does all the powerful stuff and um left-wing council and everything um, and what we find is that after getting her elected and she's been in office for a long time, the people that we're fighting is just her. It's just it's just the left wing people because they're just doing the same things to us that, that we try to we try to uh, stop before. And, you know, there's there's degrees of gradient there where it's not, you know, if the Tories were there, it would undoubtedly be worse because, you know, while fuck Labour, the Tories are cunts. Uh, you know, there's there's differences in gradations, but we're still fighting them. We're not on their side in, in, the, in the movement. It's, it's all very much uh, confrontational. And like we've had victories uh, from from local government, and local authorities, but they've only come at the result of us as the community fighting for them, not because she was elected by a mandate from the people who then now wants to enact this change because of her or because of the local councils uh, that, that is around her sort of um, ideological positions despite being on the far left of the of the of the party. Yeah, and I think it's as it should be. I mean, in when I was talking with the Reclaim people, they told me that, uh, you know, part of their job was holding Larry Krasner accountable, that they got him elected, but that, you know, they still needed to say to him like, hey, don't you fucking do this and then make sure you do that, right? Mm. Um, or else, you know, we're not going to turn out for you again. And they've built such an effective political machine there um, that they've been able to, I believe, hold him to that in a way that they find satisfactory. But it wasn't like it wasn't a fight, you know? And some of the candidates that, you know, my movement here in Los Angeles has elected, there are portions of our movement that are furious with those candidates now that they're in power. And I'm sure that will continue to happen. You know, uh, Aonisis Hernandez, who is the, the new abolitionist who was just elected, I'm sure she's going to eventually, because she's on the city council, she's going to piss off people in her own movement, right? Um, and, and I think that's as it should be. Uh, whether or not that 
means that electoralism is something that we need to abandon. Uh, I, I don't know that I agree with that. You know, I, I, I agree when I hear people in the movement say, electoralism won't save us. It won't be how we solve these problems. Um, I don't think I agree when people say we should abandon electoralism and only work for, you know, mass, only work on mass movements for abolition um, because I don't think that we, there's a reason we can't do both at once. And I think that it uh, will we'll allow people to suffer while we do so. You know, um, if we say, ah, let's not get it, let's not get any of the progressive DAs elected. Um, well, then we're allowing mass incarceration to persist. You know, uh, mm -hmm. like I'd still rather have, you know, in Norway, they still have prisons, you know, they've got, they, sure. they don't have nearly as many people in them. Um, and I'd rather move towards that. Uh, now, that's I a debate on the left. I know, I know there's people who would disagree with me and say, well, fuck you, that means you're a reformer. Um, and I'd say, I, well, I'm not sure. I'm still thinking about it. Could we still work together on some shit while we disagree on this or while we're still talking it out? That's my view. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a question that requires very tight sort of pinpoint accuracy dealing with specific issues. And I think in the terms of DAs, it's quite a difficult one because while it's like maybe good to have progressive DAs, it's good that people aren't out of, um, aren't in prison when they should be. It can also form ways of like, one, one of the examples being um, the getting rid of cash bails has resulted in a particular way of externalizing carceralism into um, electronic tagging in particular ways in which they deal with it, which has actually expanded DA powers in certain ways. So the progressive DAs can sometimes make things more carceral, make things worse. And it, it, it's a problem that appears mm -hmm. quite a lot of the time in, um, in abolitionist, and especially as abolish, abolition politics has developed and, be, and become more mainstream and been taken in odd ways. So I think it's something that has to be done it, quite carefully. Um, I agree, but yeah. cer certainly, like there are there are cases where you go, yeah, it's good. I'm glad that there's this. There, there's not a fucking cycle with four bandoliers running this DA's office. Is yeah. <laughs> probably a good thing. But like, it, it's I think it, like it is extremely limited, and I, I do think within the confines of the show, it does push a more um, more electoral sort of framework rather than uh, anything else. I, I mean, I'd agree with you that that is what we, that, you know, that is what we specifically focus on um, in the episode on change um, mm -hmm. and that we don't focus on mass movements to the same degree. Uh, part of that is because when we were, we were literally, just to tell you again about how that episode came about, we yeah. were writing it uh, in the very months after George Floyd's murder. Um, and I was sitting here in Los Angeles saying, well, you know, Rodney King was 30 years ago, maybe more. Um, and there were protests then and nothing has changed in Los Angeles. We've been talking about these things for so long, right? Mass incarceration is our country's, in my view, greatest national sin, or at least tied for first with some other things. Um, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and like, this is something that the government does. This is something that the state does, right? What do we do about it? Um, and our research team dived into that and they came back and said, you know what the one success story is here is progressive district attorneys. And at that time it was just Larry Krasner. It was a brand new idea when we had started mm -hmm. writing about it. And this is a case where you had a social justice movement in a city try to target, okay, what do we do about mass incarceration in our city? They said, hold on a second, the DA is really powerful. They got a public defender elected. They flipped it and then they defended him while we were making the show actually is when they defended him. They, they defended him in the case, you know, in the face of every piece of press saying he was gonna lose in, you know, this massively funded backlash. Um, and so to me, that seems like a pretty good story to spread, <laughs> right? At least that's what sure. it seemed like in mid 2020. Um, of, of how do I grapple with this incredible problem? Now, our conversation on that has evolved. My own views have evolved. Uh, you know, pe people feel differently about it than they did just a couple of years ago, but it's, this, it's the same movement, <laughs> right? That got him elected in the first place um, that is having those follow-up conversations. And so I, I, you know, I stand by that, especially as an entry point for the broad public, you know, to say to the broad public, you've been fed this tough on crime line 
for years and you haven't been voting for this extremely powerful, like the, the local DA is the, the really the most powerful elected official most people know don't know about. And so as a very targeted thing to say, this is this is a way that a small group of people can massively transform criminal justice and mass incarceration in their area. That remains true, you know, and and if someone wants to come and say it's a half measure, all right, that's fine. We can work on stronger things, too. But I think it's still pretty good <laughs> to have Larry Krasner in there. Um, and, and I, by the way, I also think it's fairly radical um, by the standards of American politics. Um, so, you know, a, 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 as something to spread to a mass audience, it's still something that I'm that I'm proud of. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, if I was to if I were to be able to make a season two, um, which is, you know, always in doubt, um, but talking about like mass, truly mass movements that don't rely on voting of any kind uh, would be something I would love to do as well. However, I really do think it's telling that in Philadelphia, in my city, and in so many other cities around the country, the way that the mass social movements are trying to gain power is by getting people elected. That's the movements do it. It's not me telling them to do it, right? It's the it's the the unions trying to get their candidates elected. It's abolitionists trying to get their candidates elected, um, and uh, you know it's it's uh, social justice movements trying to get you know pub, uh, district, uh, public defenders elected as district attorneys, um, and so I, I'm willing to say, hey, let's go to bat for them and and see how it works. You know. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I won't. Um, I think going further down the road, we can probably get in deep into like. Um, deep into sure. stuff about um, public defenders and all, all the sort of stuff that probably wouldn't go in. It would probably yeah. end up going in circles. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be a great conversation, but I got about 10 more minutes. So let's, sure. let's, uh, if there's something else that you want to talk um, about, let's hit it. I mean, I think sort of those are the, those are the big, the big sort of themes that I wanted to, to um, talk about. There's sort of individual things that I think are worth talking about. One of them being, um, I think, there is a the moment in the show which I found chilling, quite chilling was the conversation with the the operators of GPS, mm -hmm. um, and the way that, that was like you talk about this is such an incredible good that we all rely on, all the world relies on GPS, and then you talk to the US military and the whole like framing of the conversation is extremely like cutesy and nice, and you talk to these ten nice people who do the nice thing, it's the guy is only twenty years old. Um, and my whole way through, I was sitting there going, fuck me, this is terrifying. This is terrifying that these people have this level of control over our lives. I don't, I, it's blowing my mind that these people can, could destroy my life from this small operating office in there. But the, the tenor of the show seems to be like, like it's a curiosity more than anything else. Well, I, I'll, what I'll say is, first of all, the reason I was nice in that room is because I'm a nice guy. And sure. <laughs> I, I would dare say, if you had the opportunity to go into the room, you would also probably be pretty nice to everybody there. You might be chilled, right? You might, uh, as you're, you're being very nice to me right now, but you're also asking me some difficult questions. I think you might do the same thing with them. Now, the reason I didn't go really full bore into them, I did say, hey, isn't, a, isn't it a little weird that the military does this, right? But I didn't get really far into it. And that's because I knew that the next segment <laughs> would be one in which I would describe like how all of this incredible technology is the wages that we paid for it were the deaths of millions of people, right? Because this is all part of the U.S. military industrial complex. So, um, the you know, the reason I was able to tonally take the one tone in the one segment was because of the very serious darkness of the rest of the episode. And that was done intentionally. Um, what I will say, uh, I, keep, I keep starting sentences with, what I will say, <laughs> and I apologize for that, it's a verbal tick. Uh, but what I will say is that the, uh, uh, in my view, the fact that the U.S. government runs the GPS system by itself is not a bad thing because we need a GPS system, right? Uh, and one of the one of the statements we do make about the government on the show is that the government is the only organization that is able to uh, provide you know unalloyed public goods that are at their best freely available to everybody right um there's a couple examples of that on the show one of them is weather prediction uh, uh you know medical research um another is i think one of the best examples is gps now i personally think it's fucked up that the military the air force actually now the space force 
um, runs the GPS system. I think it, it should be a civilian branch of the government, it should be NOAA or something like that rather than the military. Um, and the fact that the military runs it is a little chilling and it leads us down that rabbit hole to when I'm also describing how, you know, the same organization that designed GPS also invented Agent Orange, you know, led to the, the people, all this other shit. Uh, so, you know, yeah. uh, but at the end of the day, the GPS is like a lighthouse, you know, it's a, it's just a big thing. It's a big beacon that's up there that anybody can use for free. I think it's good that it's there, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I guess this would probably be a, 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 diver, a diversion to us as well. Like, I, I think it's good that there is a GPS and that it's not controlled by corporations because, you know, that would be fucked. Uh, yeah. I, I don't think it would be much less chilling to me if it was another US government agency that controlled this thing because it would still be the US government controlling... Uh, a, a fundamental need to for the whole world, which I would still find quite so, chilling. So here's my question, and this is where I don't understand. You know, I'd like to know more about your position. Um, wh how would you like such a system to be developed and administered? I mean, as as I I can't administer a, a system like that in my head at this moment. Um, it would yeah. clearly have to be something that would. I mean, the the only sort of close to. Uh, close to um, available structure that we'd have now would be something like the UN or an international agency. But even that is far from perfect. But but so so I mean you've said, you know, you you've you've hinted at what you feel a state is um, as being, you know, it, it sounds like you feel that it's a, a fundamentally sort of malign structure um, and that, you know, it, by its very existence must be you know, papering, papering over, uh, uh, you, you know, as you said, when it's when it's providing goods or or giving people rights or things like that, it's it's in order to sort of, you know, obscure the real work that it's doing. But like in your mind, is there a state? Is there a version of a state that does only good things? Because one of the purposes of the show was to say, hey, there are certain duties that we need done or goods provided in society that we need to be provided. Um, and that at its best, a government is the only thing that can provide those things equally and productively in a way to all people. Now, it fails at that all of the time, right, mm -hmm. constantly, uh, but there are these little glimmers of spots where you can find, aha, this is a public good that the government provides that we want to safeguard, and we want the government to do more things like this and less things like that. We want more GPS and less d drone strikes, <laughs> right? Sure. Sure. Um, but, it, and, you know, that's sort of part of the project is getting people to start thinking about those things differently. Um, do you have in mind any sort of state that can do just the good things? Or are you, do you I mean, feel, I, hey, I, all governments are bad? I, I'm not an anarchist. So, like, okay. I, so, so I, I'm not, like, innately proposed to, like, forms of social organization, which at a different point might be considered a state. When we talk, when I'm talking about the state, I am at this point talking about the capitalist state, the state as it functions. Mm. Because I think like one of the one of the main problems of like a lot of the definitions of the state is the thing that has the monopoly on force. But like obviously the feudal state is different to a capitalist state. And right. I, I, pr I propose socialist state would be functionally different from a from a capitalist state. The question then is, do you take over the levers of the state which exist as they are? Or do you break them down and build something new, which would be described as a state in those circumstances? And I'm not smart enough to have the answers to that right now. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, um, I just I, that, that, that's yeah. fine, man. And, and and neither am I, you know. Right. And and I know that there's this p possibility that look, if if you want to come to me and say, hey, the main thing you didn't say in your show is that the United States government is a capitalist state and that it, you know, it has no redeeming value and must be uh, demolished uh, in order to, you know, bring any measure of, of reprieve from oppression from, you know, Americans and other people around the world. I'd say, yeah, you might be right. Like, <laughs> that's, that's, a I would also, that, <laughs> I would also say that, settler colonial. <laughs> and so, okay, great. Thank you so much. And settler colonialism, right? Uh, yeah, you might be right. That's like a question I'm I'm interested in investigating and finding out the answer to, um, and like what what we could replace it with instead. I'm I'm glad that you don't feel you have all the answers because I certainly don't feel that I do. Um, however, I don't think that 
uh, I'm not so sure of that, that I don't think that the project of also figuring out how can we adjust the fucking world we live in today a bit is not worth pursuing, you know, mm. uh, that I still think it's a value to say to people, hey, there are certain things you've been told your entire life that the government is just out to get you is just stealing your money, right? But guess what? When we work together, when we take collective action for the common good, there are certain things that we can do that cannot be provided for in any other way. And that's something that you can be a part of. That's sort of the fundamental message of the show. And, and I still think that that's valuable, even though I'm not saying, you know, hey, let's destroy the capitalist state and replace it with uh, something new that we don't know what that is yet because we're still deciding it among ourselves. You know, um, I, I, I think those theoretical questions about what the state is, what we could replace it with, you know, are we <laughs> anarchism, communism, all these things. Those are great conversations to have. Not the focus of this show. This show is trying to just like get people thinking a little bit more deeply about the state that they currently live in. Um, and, you know, that's, uh, that's what we did our best to do. Uh, and so, but, but, you know, just get, coming back to the GPS thing, I'm glad that you were chilled by the segment in the GPS uh, in there. I was also a little chilled being in there. That's kind of the fucking point was to present that contrast between those things that the that the military does. It's meant to feel a little bit weird that we're in there. I felt weird being in there. Um, that's uh, you know it's it's not a it's not a place with easy answers. Um, it is the case that the government you know released GPS available to civilian use because it just seemed like a good idea. <laughs> you know, like hey, this would be useful. The, to um, people. Do you think the accountant? in middle america would also be chilled by that or do you think because what obviously one of the big forces in american ideology is love for the troops so would would you not well for some for, for, for some but not for all you know um like i can't i can't like force people to have the reaction that i want them to have uh and and that's sort of what i'm doing as a mass communicator i mean you can see that for instance when i go into the um uh, the the Cargill meat processing plant, right, with the USDA, and we see how you know USDA inspectors inspect meat. I'm made that knowing that look, I'm someone who thinks that factory farming is is a cruel abomination, right? Mm. That should be ended. Um, I also I avoid eating meat, but I do eat it sometimes. I have complex feelings about it, right? As do most people. I knew the show would be watched by people who are like, "Fuck yeah, bacon, bleh, pita, pff, fuck you." Right? There are people who are going to watch the show feel that way. Um, there are other people who are going to watch. There, I knew there would be people who would turn it off the moment I, sh I showed a cow because mm. they'd be like, that cow's going to die. And I heard people tweeted at me that I couldn't watch the show past that moment. Um, I'm trying to serve all those people because I'm speaking to a mass audience. Um, and so what I did was I went in and I had an honest reaction to it. I was disturbed and unsettled by what I saw. And I was also very interested in what the fuck is it like to work in here, especially if you're a veterinarian who loves animals, you know? Mm. And we what we found in there was complex and it didn't have an easy answer to it and i think the same thing is true of the of the gps segment like um i think that gps is incredibly fucking cool i think it's an unalloyed public good there's nothing bad and only good of you know coming from the gps segment uh, gps system that we receive except for the fact <laughs> that it was <laughs> that like part of its birth is you know uh, American military hegemony in the deaths of millions? Um, well, the ability that's, to that's track the story. everyone. <laughs> well, no GPS does GPS doesn't track people, right? The GPS satellites, all the GPS satellites do, they're lighthouses. They go through the sky and they go, "Here I am, here I am, here I am, here I am." Right? They just beam a signal back to Earth, and then you have a device in whatever you, your watch, your phone, whatever it is, that picks up that signal and decides where you are, right? But it's the tech companies that use that to track you, right? The government isn't tracking you using the GPS satellite. The GPS satellite doesn't receive a signal from anybody. It just is a lighthouse, right? Right, right. So, but so that that bit of like technology, you're saying, the technology creates that, like you were saying earlier, the moral yeah, fair. sort of uh, position to track people. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean that's fair. I would say that that's a more fundamental you know, technological innovation, like, you know, the written word can be used to, to enlighten or deceive, uh, and a lot. Now I think nothing good comes out of the invention of, uh, of combat drones, um, would be a distinction yeah. that I draw, um, because that's a technology whose purpose is to kill. Uh, yeah. but you know, the, these are, th this shit is complicated, you know? So, um, I, I yeah, 
I, I could go on and on. Do yeah, you, have, yeah. you have anything else you, you want to talk about? Just, yeah, just one one final question, which won't take long. Please. Because my flatmate will um, slap me if I don't ask. Um, <laughs> the scene when you're talking about drones and it goes in on a wedding strike, was that yeah. deliberate? <laughs> was that a deliberate of course it was. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yes, um, of course it was. Yeah. Of course it was. And and I'll uh, I'll tell you, there there was literally only one piece of direct censorship from Barack Obama's team. Not, and I don't mean like his his like his like political team. It's like people who work for him, who work for him, who work for him, who work for him, you know, mm-hmm. people layers down who work on the television side of the operation. Um, but we used to have a joke in there that was, um, you know, they're used by uh, videographers, et cetera. Um, uh, but while they've gotten us some beautiful wedding shots, they've also shot up a couple weddings. Um, that was a, a very dark joke written by one of our comedy writers that I really loved. And uh, one of our executives said, oh, you can't do that joke. And I was like, mm, I'll, I'll go to the mattresses for it. And we fought back and forth over that joke for a couple of weeks and I didn't make it in. But I, I eventually rested knowing that like, yeah, people are going to get the reference. That, yeah. That's that's obviously what yeah. it was too. Yes. Um, okay. I think that's that's sort of the end of what, what we what I could probably what I can probably do here. I think just for sort of just to give like wider scope, I don't think it would have been impossible for me to like go through my theoretical sort of qualms and like the the foundational ideological problems that I think are snuck into this show because that would re- require me to talk at you for about an hour uh, to explain myself, which isn't really possible in this uh, place and time. But I think it's. Use- I'd be I'd be interested to hear it. Uh, let me just say, well, like, I think if, that's- if you want to if you want to do a follow up, I'd be happy to uh, like I, I find it very fascinating. So that is, I'd I be think- happy to grapple with it more. The, the structure of what the video I think is is going to do, and and um, I, I I don't feel like the, um, you've necessarily assuaged my my views on the show, um, but it has been inter- I think it's been interesting to hear, especially your, your perspectives on the movement building and the way that you've um, progressed uh, since the show, and uh, your perspective on like what you how you've made the show within the confines of Netflix and. Uh, talking to talking to a mass audience that's not my twenty thousand communist friends <laughs> on YouTube, um, but I uh, yeah I where I I will still sort of make this video and I will pick out things which I'm sure you may think might be unfair in some instances. I'm I'm sure you will because you've put your heart into a show that that is that you that you think is valuable, um, but it's it's not I'm not going to be nasty to you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that, John. No, I, I, I really appreciate having the conversation. Um, I, 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 it's really important to me that, you know, a show like ours be open to criticism and dialogue because that's the fucking process, you know, that's like the, the, that's the academic process. That's the process of how we like learn more and how I like test my own ideas and, and grow as a person is by mm. talking to people like yourself uh again my my hope is that you know even if i don't share all of your particular ideological commitments or maybe under you know understandings or framings of what the state is or or how we might reform the state etc um I, I do i do feel like we're working under the same project here uh and i hope that we're able to I don't know. Continue to continue to have a discussion about it because, yeah. um, I mean, one I, one of the things that I try try to do, a, a video, especially one like this, or a few ones that I've done when I've seen something that has annoyed me a bit, is like I can't, I was like, how can I make this useful? That's not just me ranting about something that I didn't like. And so the 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 useful part of this is the part where I get to sneak in teaching some people theories of the state, where they're like, oh, yeah, John's going to dunk on Adam Conover. It's like, no, you're going to learn about Gramsci, you <laughs> nerds. <laughs> Look, if you can dunk on me in the name of actually in the name of actually teaching people things, I would love that. People, yeah. love, people dunk on me all the time, and sometimes it's just a cheap dunk, you know? Yeah. But if it's in the name of actually, like, teaching us something and doing it in a good faith, you know, productive mm. way, I'm all for that, because uh, that's, you know, that, that's all we can do. Here and you know, look, I, I just, I just want the main reason I wanted to talk to you is I just wanted to make sure 
that you knew I'm just a guy who's fucking doing my best here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just trying to just trying to like I don't think you're ideas. a super villain. Yeah. <laughs> OK, good. OK, good. And, and and here's the other thing is that there's this idea that you hear out there that like in capitalist media, it's impossible to have any real conversations about anything real because the system will always protect itself and blah, 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 blah. And I don't believe that that's true. I think it's difficult to have these conversations in mass media, but I think it can be done if you are really strategic about it, if you get really, really good at communicating with people, if you pick your battles, um, et cetera. And that's what I've devoted my life to, is to try to spread ideas that don't normally get spread via mass media. Um, in whatever way I can. And so again, on you know, when I was on advertising supported television, it was like spreading the truth about capitalism and advertising. When I'm like working for Barack Obama, it's like, all right, we're gonna fucking talk about drone strikes. Like this is what we do. Um, and you know, I, I don't get to quite say things in exactly the same way if I would if I was on YouTube, but I'm mm -hmm. and I'm only speaking to 20,000 communists. But um, I think we can yeah. see ourselves as part of a same continuum that is maybe trying to move everything in the same direction. That is my hope. People in the comments of your video can tell me I'm full of shit if they want. Um, but that's that's the project I'm trying to engage in. Um, and if people have notes on how I can do it better, I'm always open to them. And that's why I'm happy to talk to you today. Oh, they're happy to get me then as well. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, well, thank you so much for taking the time, John. I, I really love this conversation. Yeah, I appreciate it so much. Uh